This is my second year growing hops. I got a pretty good harvest off my Chinook plant, so I decided to use them all for a fresh hop IPA. So come along as I talk a little bit about growing and drying hops, and then also using them to brew a beer. I'm a little curious how my homegrown Chinook hops will compare to commercial varieties. Well, let's get brewing. Well, thanks for dropping by. My name is Brent from Cascades Homebrew. My passion is homebrewing. I've been doing it for over 25 years. The focus of my channel is on brewing great beer at home using modest equipment and simple processes. So if that sounds interesting to you, or if you just want to learn more about homebrewing, be sure to click that subscribe button. That way you can find your way back to my new content. So have you ever brewed a beer with fresh grown hops? Do you think growing hops at home is worth the price and the effort? Well, leave a note down in the comment. Let me know your experience. And while you're thinking about that, well, let's get into brewing this beer. This video is not a deep dive into growing hops. I'm still learning how myself, but that might be the subject of a future video. In early 2020, I ordered four hop plants from Great Lakes Hops. Here are the plants in May of 2020. Then in July of 2020, I harvested around eight ounce of wet hops from the Chinook plants and made a fresh hop blonde in August of 2020. It was an okay beer with a very light hop character. Fast forward to May of 2021 and the Chinook and Triple Pearl hops are much further along than they were at the same point in 2020. The other two plants are much further behind. By July of 2021, I'm seeing lots of nice looking cones on both the Chinook and Triple Pearl plants. I think I should have trimmed back some of the initial binds because as I got into August, the plants had a mix of old, ripe, and young cones. I cut down the Chinook plant for harvesting. I picked off all the nice looking ripe cones. The dried out brown cones went into the compost bin. It took a bit of time and effort but I was able to harvest a pretty good bucket full of cones. The smell of the cones made me excited to put these to use in a beer. I spread out the hop cones on some window screens in my garage with a fan blowing from underneath. After a couple of days, the hop cones were dry and papery. I separated them into two bags with 4.3 ounces of dried hops each and stuck them in my hop freezer with the other hops that I need to use up soon. I was hoping that I would be able to put them to use in a brew day very soon. After about five weeks in the freezer, that brew day had arrived. I'm calling this batch a fresh hop IPA. I went with a really light grain bill for this one. Beersmith calculated 85 IBUs, but given that I'm using homegrown hops, I don't put too much faith in that calculated value. I knew I was going to lose some amount of wort to the hops, so I jiggled the numbers in Beersmith with a general goal of a beer somewhere close to 7.5% ABV. I missed my target original gravity by a few points, but my final gravity ended up a little bit lower, giving me a beer around 7.8%. I bumped up my chloride and calcium levels a little bit higher than my standard American IPA profile. Part of the motivation was to see the impact that more calcium would have on the mash pH and also on the final beer. So in theory, I should be able to lower the pH with a little less acid addition. So for this batch, I added 9.3 grams of gypsum, 3 grams of calcium chloride, 9.2 milliliters of 10% phosphoric acid. I measured a pH of 5.5, which is just a bit over my target of 5.4. I also added half of a Camden tablet. Here are a bunch of numbers on the screen to try to confuse you. With the amount of grain needed to hit my gravity, and also adding some extra volume to make up for the expected loss from all the whole hops, I decided that holding back two gallons for a dunk sparge was my best plan. The mash target was 152 Fahrenheit or 66.7 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes with just a 30 minute boil. I went with a simple and light colored grain bill for this one. The general idea was to try an IPA that was 50% pale malt and 50% pale ale malt. I needed a total of 14 pounds or 6.4 kilograms of barley. I ended up with a higher percentage of the pale malt just to use up the last of a bucket of mutton super pale malt. Then I used Chris Maris Otter for the remaining. I don't think I've ever made an IPA without some specialty malts and I usually use crystal malts. I also don't use a pale ale malt like Maris Otter very often in American IPAs or pale ales. So I was curious how this one would turn out. 
With the 60 minute mash complete, it was time for the dunk sparge step. Basically, I had just transferred two gallons of unheated tap water into this bucket. After letting the grain bag drain for a minute or two, I moved the bag into the bucket. The last time I did this was for an imperial stout. The large amount of grain barely fit into the bucket and I made a mess in the transfer. This one went smoothly though. I then gave the mixture a good stir. It was pretty thick, but with a little bit of stirring it loosened up a bit. After letting the dunk sparge mix sit for a few minutes, I hoisted up the grain bag to let it drain. I took advantage of my pulley and my ability to hang items from my overhead deck structure. While the sparge step was occurring, the rest of the wort was heating up towards a boil. I added the liquid from the sparge into the kettle. I was a little over my calculated pre-boil volume, but I think I lost more volume to the hops than I guessed, so it evened out in the end. This batch did not have a traditional bittering hop addition. It only got a 30 minute boil. So now is the moment we've all been waiting for. No, not the Werflock tablet. The first edition of the homegrown Chinook hops. I added half the hops with 10 minutes left in the boil. Will this really add 62 IBUs? Uh, I guess we'll see at the tasting. I boiled the wort for 10 more minutes. I used my immersion chiller to quickly drop the wort temperature down to 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 degrees Celsius. After removing the wort chiller, it was that time again. More hops. I added the other half of the hops and let them steep for 20 minutes, giving the hops a stir a few times during that time. Again, I really don't know what to expect from the IBUs from this edition. I then broke out my new toy. I recently acquired this jaded Hydra immersion chiller. It was my first time giving it a try. But given that my groundwater measured around 73 degrees Fahrenheit this time of year, and all the whole cone hops loose in the kettle made circulating the wort quite a challenge, there was only so much it could do. But I think this would be a solid piece of equipment, and I'll likely put out a video with my experience with the chiller in the near future. I then transferred the wort into the fermenters. There were a lot of whole cone hops that made this a bit of a challenge. But the good news is that whole cone hops don't clog up my strainer like pellets do. I was left with a pretty large mass of soggy hops. So I've been trying it out a number of dry yeasts lately. This batch was split and fermented with two dry yeasts as well. One fermenter got Lollamon BRY 97 and one fermenter got Cellar Science Cali Ale. Look out for a future video where I talk more about the fermentation process and compare those two yeasts. I used a pretty standard ale fermentation schedule. I chilled the batch down to 64 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius. As fermentation for both batches slowed, I boosted the temperature to 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. Then, after about two weeks, I did a closed keg transfer. All right, well here's the beer. I think it's been in the keg for about two weeks now. It's starting to clear up nicely. It's got a little bit of a haze, but I think it'll probably eventually drop clear. So I went ahead and put together some tasting notes so we can stay focused on evaluating this beer. So appearance on the beer, it's got a nice light golden color. Some complexity given this very simple grain bill. It's also got a white creamy head. It's got a lot of nice lacing, which again, given the simple grain bill, it's kind of interesting because I usually think wheat adds a lot of that lacing to some of my beers, but maybe I'm just imagining that. It's got a slight haze that I expect will drop fairly clear given another week or two in the keg. So if we go in for aroma, I get a lot of nice, you know, hop character into it. It's not probably not as intense as it would be if it was a dry hop beer. I get a lot of really nice, I get a subtle dank character. I get a lot of this sort of tropical fruit. Um, I, I think pineapple is kind of what comes to my mind when I, when I get the aroma. I'm not really getting any malt or grain character in the aroma. All right, let's go in for a taste on this beer. Uh, it's a nice beer. So if I first address the, uh, the bitterness, the IBUs calculated were pretty high. There's definitely a backbone bitterness on this beer. I think it's probably less than the calculated IBUs. I think it's in balance. It's got a really nice kind of sweet malt character in it. Like I don't think it's too sweet. I think the IBUs and the malt character are in line. Though it probably does lean a little bit more toward the malty sweet side than the bitter side. It's got lots of nice hop flavors. So it's very similar to the aroma. Yeah, I get a lot of that sort of tropical, maybe some pineapple, maybe a little bit more citrus on the flavor than I do on the aroma. So interesting for 100% Chinook beer, I really don't get that pine that I associate with Chinook. So if we look at the body on the beer, sort of a medium light body, 
kind of leans a little bit more toward the medium, but I think that's in line giving the uh, original gravity and the ABV of this beer. I'm not really getting any uh, you know harsh alcohol tones off this beer. I do get a little bit of an astringency. It's very similar to the last IPA I made, which was using the Cellar Science Cali Ale. I'm kind of wondering if the Cellar Science Cali Ale really is just repack as US05, because I feel like I've gotten a little different character out of these last two Cellar Science Cali Ale beers than I've gotten out of US05 in the past. So what do I, do I have any overall takeaways on this beer? So one, I think it's a, just a really nice drinking beer and it's unique, right? It's hops that I grew at home. It's a beer that nobody else can make. Another thing I would add, it's got a really nice flavorful malt bill. Given it was such a simple malt bill, it's kind of an interesting concept because I usually add some crystal malt to my IPAs and my house IPA also has some wheat in it as well. It was kind of hard for me to exactly pick out exactly what the Maris Otter is adding to the beer. There's just a lot of hot flavors that kind of cover it up. But it does have a nice golden color to it. I think a lot of that must come from the Maris Otter. And also this beer, I added a little bit of calcium chloride to bump up my chloride ratio and also give it a little bit more calcium. It's kind of hard to tell exactly what that adds. Does that add a little bit of the fullness that I'm getting from the beer? Or is the mouthfeel really just based on the higher gravity? So I mentioned earlier in the video, I split this batch with Cellar Science Cali Ale and then also BRY97. This was my very first time using BRY97, so today I was tasting the Cali Ale batch. But don't worry, I've got a video in progress where I talk a little bit more about the different fermentation between the two yeasts. Then I'm going to come back, taste the beer, and talk a little bit more about the yeast character differences between the two batches. So spoiler alert, I really did like the BRY97 batch. That yeast might be in contention for my house IPA PLL yeast. Once that video is published, be sure to check out the link of it here. For now, check out this other recommended video. And also, check on this playlist for other great ideas on building great beer. So clicking that like button is a sign to YouTube that's worth recommending my videos to others. And be sure to subscribe so my new content makes it into your feed. Cheers!